hypocritical racists who protect the turf of judges. Surely that could not be our High Court Australia. High Court Biases in Firing Line by Michael Paley, July 17, 2009. Yet on what we have seen this year, and what is to come, there will be plenty of ammo for those who like to stir the pot. Already the court has covered topics ranging from the Northern Territory intervention worry to the tax stimulus package paper. There will be a further 30 of judgments on matters such as the military court, water compensation and of the limits of case management by courts. Wurigil saw Chief Justice Robert French fume at the gratuitous suggestion of the retiring Michael Kirby that the outcome of this case was based on an approach less favorable to the plaintiffs because of their aboriginality. Kirby did not actually call his fellow judges racist, but when he said they could have knocked over legislation that applied to Aboriginal Australians by specific reference to their race others, such as French, made the leap. The case with the hypocrisy factor involves the challenge by former South Australian MP Ralph Clark to the 1,997 surcharge imposed on his pension. Six years ago, New South Wales Supreme Court Judge Bob Austin successfully argued that the surcharge should not apply to state judges. He said the judicial pension was not superannuation, that judges' pay could not be lowered and doing so would affect the recruitment of quality candidates. He also noted other high-income owners would have the surcharge met from their superannuation funds provider or the fund itself. Clark made similar arguments, but the full federal court rejected the quality of candidate claim, saying the surcharge had no impact on the decisions of people to stand for parliament. They also found Clark was not as badly affected because he could take lump sum benefits. Justice Bill Gummer said during the hearing in March that the case was about interference by a federal statute in a substantial manner with the exercise of constitutional power by the states. But does anyone want to bet against the decision being compared to Austin and talk about a goose and a gander? If Clark is potentially tricky, then so is another constitutional case on the powers and functions of courts. In the first of these turf war cases, Lane v. Morrison, there was enough in argument to suggest the validity of the military court was in serious doubt. Former leading seaman Brian Lane was charged with assault after placing his genitals on a superior's forehead when he was asleep, a practice known as teabagging. Lane argued the judges were part of a chain of command and that conviction by the court, which was established in 2007 and had already made about 200 decisions, would mean he carried a criminal record that would have affected his ability to travel and seek other jobs. As Dyson Hoyden said, the point was whether events in the military court might detract from the power of state courts over criminal cases. Another intriguing case, involving water rights starts, has the potential to upset the apple cart. The country's largest privately owned agribusiness, ICM, says the Commonwealth's $135 million government scheme to compensate primary producers for drastically reduced water use is invalid because it does not offer just terms for the acquisition of property. ICM says the New South Wales government has cut its entitlements by more than 70% as a result of a funding agreement with the Commonwealth. It says the relevant act is invalid because it authorizes the Commonwealth to enter into an intergovernmental agreement in breach of the just terms requirement. Victory for ICM will render problematic the Rudd government's billion dollar plan to buy back entitlements and restore the Murray-Darling Basin. It will also say a bit about the future of complementary legislation, which will become more frequent with the government tabling an ambitious agenda for the Council of Australian Governments. That three days have already been set aside from August 24 indicates it is hardly run of the mill. Those arguing the case will hope to fare better than Victorian QC Gerard Nash, who seemed unsettled by the demeanour of the court as he argued for special leave in a criminal case last month. If I may say so, I am terribly intimidated by the fact that the court is not attacking me sufficiently because... Ken Hain beware the silent court. Nash I at least expected your honour, Justice Hain, to offer me an olive branch with which you could beat me to death, if I can turn reluctantly, because I feel terribly uneasy with the silence from the bench, to the second limb. Come mo do not provoke us. Best advocates steer clear of any quips about hypocritical racists then.